Good afternoon. Thank you for attending our Next Tech webinar series. This afternoon, we'll be talking about reducing COVID-19, specifically the risk and addressing what regulatory and liability concerns would be in place with that. This afternoon's presentation is brought to you by Courtney Tezvich, our VP of Regulatory, and myself, Raman and Toe, Managing uh, Manager of Professional Services Consulting. Just a quick reminder, we will be um, taking questions at the end if time permits, so please just put them into the question box, as well as we will be sending out this webinar. Uh, you'll receive an email with the link following this presentation, either later today or tomorrow, so that will be made available to you. Just a quick reminder, this presentation is not meant to be prescriptive in any way. It is meant to be an informative to help guide you and give you information so that you can um, make the right decisions and uh, perform that more prescriptive approach. So with that, one of the key takeaways with today's presentation, you should think generally about how you proactively are taking steps to manage your patients as well as your staff, but in so doing, you're protecting your practice. And we're not talking about just protecting your practice about risk of exposure from COVID. We're gonna think about it a little bit more with the respect of the risk that you incur with the lack of compliance. What does that look like and how does that increase your liability concerns? So we're gonna look at this from three perspectives. We're gonna look at exposure, compliance, and then finally resurgence. So with safeguarding your practice, exposure is not just your exposure to COVID, but the exposure is based upon policies and processes that you put in place to protect you. So exposure can be reduced with respect to the liability that you might incur, whether it's malpractice or workman's comp, et cetera, based upon policies and processes that you put in place. But beyond that, we don't just want to write the policy. We don't want to just train our staff about the new process. We need to ensure that we have compliance. You can't reduce your liability and protect your practice if you don't enforce the rules, if you don't encourage your staff to do what you've asked them to do and follow through. And then if we don't enforce it, then we're open to a resurgence. And what we don't want is to be back in a position where we have to close our doors again we know that economically that can be disastrous to many of our practices. Many of our practices have already indicated um, what concerns they have about reopening and the economics of the future. So we all have to take those active steps in ensuring that we follow the guidelines to reduce that risk. So some operational things that you wanna consider. You're going to see today a lot of links that I have put into the presentation to give you some direct reference, um, a lot of things from the um, CDC, from OSHA, um, straight from the White House, Opening America. These are things that will be made available to you following the presentation, but they're also in the presentation so that you'll have direct reference to the content. So as an operation, as a business, something to consider when you're thinking about opening, or those of you that have opened, I live in Georgia, some of the practices have started opening. In fact, um, elective surgery actually started this week. But you need to keep in mind that you're meeting the gating criteria. What you don't want to do is open your doors before you're supposed to. That is a risk of being fined or other implications that might come your way. And Courtney's going to talk to you later about the bad that can happen. So she's going to give you all of the um, she's going to be the bad cop, so to speak, in this presentation and give you all the things to think about that can happen and things that have already happened. So with that, you want to think about scheduling considerations, which we're going to spend a little bit of time on. You also want to think about which services you should be performing in stage one. So while the CDC just two days ago released information that um, they're releasing the ban on not performing elective procedures, it still doesn't mean that you can or should on everybody. You need to follow the rules based upon your local legislation. Look at what stage you're in and what you're permitted to do. And then finally, you wanna make sure that you're looking at the patient and understanding the priority because while we may be opening our doors, we still want to tread carefully so that we don't put ourselves in a place of unnecessary risk. We need to make sure that our patients are safe as well. So as you're opening doors, something to consider. 
you want to make sure that you're testing your staff. Um, and not just from, from the perspective of not only knowing that they don't have COVID, but having that documentation in place that you have tested your staff should be put in their employee file. It ensures that you've got um, information in place that as you reopen, you've done your due diligence to ensure that you're opening in the safest format. Beyond just doing that before they come in, think about daily screenings. It's no different than you screening your patients before they come into practice. Your patients ensure that, um, I mean, your patients do present a risk because we don't know where they've been in contact with anybody or what their environment is like. But your staff have much of the same circumstances. They might leave work and go to the grocery store and don't realize that they've been exposed. So you need to constantly be diligent in ensuring that you do daily screenings and frequency is never really too much in this case. One of the practices that I work with actually created a log and not only do they take the staff temperature in the morning and do the screening questions, they do it at the end of the day and they document that and they document those responses. So again, it's a process that they're following through with that while it might seem tedious, one has to think that these are there and in place to help protect. And then in an ongoing format, um, you wanna make sure that you're continually monitoring your staff, make sure that you're um, reducing the risk by understanding where they've spent the weekend and what they're doing. And not that you wanna infringe upon their privacy, but they should be willing to you know, insert within your environment a sense of safety for themselves as well as the people they work with. Because once and once we get down to the bottom of this, the business has to be substantially in place so that you can pay the bill, so that you can pay your staff. So looking at that, we're going to look at some exposure and return to work guidelines. So first of all, define exposure. The CDC has done a fabulous job of putting together materials out there, and there's so much information, you can almost get lost in it. But they do have specific sections that are um, for healthcare providers and healthcare in its whole essence, you should really get in there and dig through it. So we as a practice should be defining what exposure is, but then we needed to, to put a plan in place and understand that plan and actually practice the plan. Do you have a plan for exposure if someone is asymptomatic and what they should be doing to return to work? What about exposure for someone that's symptomatic and how you exclude them from work and what the plan is? But one thing is for certain, you should look at the guidelines that the CDC is offering and um, pay close attention to those things. Staff education, you cannot do too much of this. This is the time when things are slower to really emphasize education. I've talked about this in my previous webinars and I'm gonna talk about it again. You want to test your staff, you want to practice, you want to give them the opportunity to walk through that workflow because we defined a new way to see our patients. We defined a new process and practice makes perfect. So it is important to ensure that you walk through each of those processes, but you wanna document that you've done the training because one of the concerns that a lot of practices have is, well, what if my staff member gets exposed and what risks do I have? What is my liability? And so one of the ways to decrease your liability is to start with the training but then follow through with documentation that the staff participated and that this was in place as part, uh, as part of one of your processes. Think about how you clean your office. Do you have EPA approved cleaning chemicals? Um, make sure that you're following through with that. There's actually a list of EPA approved uh, uh, known products that are effective against the coronavirus. So I've inserted this link here, but you wanna make sure that you're using those products and that you have the MSDS sheets on file for those as well. Make sure that you're looking at having policies. Um, what are the policies for cleaning in between patients, um, cleaning the common areas? So you wanna look at those things and ensure that those are in place as a written policy. You can see here that I've put um, a link again to OSHA because they've actually referenced some common things that you should consider with cleaning know how your cleaning company is going to be cleaning your practice you know what protective equipment are they using what policies are they following through with you know one of the things that we all worry about is letting someone in our home so you know those of us that you know have a cleaning team that comes in and cleans for us 
the worry is, okay, well, where have they been? Now they're coming into my safe zone, so to speak, my home. And do I want to let them in? Like, you know, I'm not certain that I want to continue to have to do all the cleaning myself, but at the same time, do I really want to put myself at risk? And your practice is your home during the day. And so you want to think about how you clean and make sure your cleaning team is clean, is cleaning as well as protecting your environment. So let's talk about scheduling considerations. So we've talked a lot in our previous webinars about telemedicine, telehealth, um, virtual waiting rooms. But what you want to think about is considering the long term of telemedicine. Does that have a place? Where does it fit in? Do we just stop doing telemedicine? I think there is definitely still a place for it. And I think that there's a few ways to look at it. One is, am I using it to manage those patients that are higher risk? But I can also look at this as being a way to expand my availability, my schedule. And I'm going to show you how in just a minute. But with that, you always want to think about when you're scheduling, telehealth is a better option for patients that are high risk. So with different specialties, we constantly are considering, well, what can I schedule? What are my options? What types of visits? Well, don't make it a mystery. Put it in black and white. Define what should be and could be a telehealth visit. Teach your staff what it is. Put it in writing and then script it. Teach your staff how to talk through it, how to manage those patients, because this, again, is a new process. And finally, you want to make sure that your patients are completing and adhering to the portal because that's going to help cut down and ensure that contactless environment. So during phase one and two of our rollout, as we're stepping back into it, we're going to slow things down. And as we're slowing things down, we're thinking, OK, now I'm trying to recoup some revenue. I'm trying to get back into business. I'm trying to financially be safe again. But now I've reduced my schedule. So how can I do that? And as you can see, one of the things that you um, want to do is actually not only identify in your schedule where cleaning would be. So the red area here is putting right in the template when we're going to do cleaning. So it's in between visits. But one, one practice did with me recently is they, they got really clever. They're like, you know, while my staff are turning over the room and cleaning, I could be doing a telehealth visit. And, you know, for those of you that do a lot of elective procedures, your patient coordinator can be your chaperone or be part of that visit with you while the MA is actually you know, turning the room over. So what I'm saying is get creative. Think about where you can expand your schedule and where telehealth might fit into that. With scheduling, we want to think about surgery and procedures. When is it really safe? What considerations do I need to take, um, put in place as far as exposure? You know, one of the fears that I hear from my surgeons is, I don't want to be the one that took my patient to surgery and they got a facelift and then they get COVID. So and it's a fear. It's, it's a concern. And as a physician, it's honorable to know that you would feel that way. But in the same token, make sure that you're using your society informed consents. Make sure that you're testing your patients. And in some cases, I've heard that they're testing them more than once, you know, um, at pre-op and then again, um, you know, one to two days before surgery. And that may seem like that's not enough because a patient can be exposed as much as, you know, the morning of surgery. You still want the protocols in place because more is never going to be too much. Triaging your patients. So we've talked about scheduling our patients. Now let's talk about, again, how do we reduce that risk? So you want to think about putting that triage system in place. So a lot of times we haven't really spent the time triaging patients from the respect of calling them and doing our screening or completing their medical history. Most of the time, our chart prep, so to speak, was in the form of making sure that if the patient had a balance, that the front desk knew about it and knew to collect it. Running eligibility to make sure that the patient's insurance was in place and actually valid. Understanding what their copay was and documenting that. That's normal and that will go on, but we need to now step into the new norm, which is triaging our patients. And doing that is going to help you understand whether the patient should be rescheduled or moved to telehealth. And what I'm also proposing here is that you look at scripting your staff. Don't leave it up to them to decide what the script should be. Write out what those various scripts should say, whether it's 
okay, I understand through my screening questions that you potentially need to be moved into a telehealth visit. So let's look at that as an option. The CDC has done a really nice job of giving you actually some phone advice lines. And I would encourage you to look into that. And even if it doesn't give you the exact verbiage that you would like, it at least gives you some guidance and some um, points to fall back on. And it may, may seem like a trivial fact to script your patients, but again, prescriptive is difficult to define in the world of COVID. There's a lot of advice that's informative for you. What you need to do is take all the information you're getting, take the information and put it in a very prescriptive format in your processes and in your, and in your practice, such that if you are in a position where there's a liability risk and you all of a sudden find that there's a malpractice suit against you, you can fall back on the rules and regulations that you put in place to reduce risk as much as possible. So we also need to think about when the patient arrives and during the visits. Um, lock the front door, make sure that there's a single point of entry, make sure that the patients can't wander into the practice. So controlled access is gonna be very important. You want to use that I'm here on our patient app so that the patients let you know that they're here and then you communicate with them when it is safe for them to come into the office. And then you wanna meet them and then go through your screening process and make sure that you're um, ensuring the patient has the appropriate protective equipment and that you have done your due diligence at the door to ensure that they don't have a fever and you've screened them once again. Again, a new process. And those of you that have opened the doors have probably put that in place, but I also can see where this gets lax and people start to forget to do it or they leave the door unlocked and it just takes one person to change that level of risk. And then all of a sudden you're a practice that has all of your staff sick and no one there to help you see patients. Something to consider, that's why you need the rules. That's why you need to be diligent in making sure they're followed through with. So you wanna make sure that your visit documents. So use that EMR note to document that the patient had the screening, what the screening questions were, document the actual temperature. Those are things that are there to help protect you. So documentation again is important. Um, make sure that you consider looking at a type of consent that is an informed consent to the patient that is indicative of the risk and them coming into the practice as an inherent risk. I know that many of the societies are um, creating and putting these out for their members to use. So I would advise and encourage you to look into that. There's Again, there's no such thing as too much in this. Um, make sure you're auditing. Make sure that you're looking for completeness in your documentation. So um, did your staff ensure that all the screening questions were addressed and answered and documented, as well as did they sign applicable consents. You don't wanna miss those parts. So what do you do if your staff or your patient has symptoms? Do you have a plan? Um, have you thought through what that looks like? You know, think about when you were, um, I don't know, go back to elementary school and there was drills that they had us go through for like, you know, uh, a hurricane or a tornado and you know they'd line us all up and march us out and put us under the bleachers or whatever it may have been now i'm expressing and exposing my age but at the same time there was a plan and it was a rehearsed plan so you as a practice to protect yourself should think about do i have a plan what is my plan and how do i manage it if those of you that have a surgery center you run codes you actually test what you would do in the middle of a code it's no different in this case. You need to ensure that your staff know exactly how to address it. Um, ensure that you train them and you document the process. So here's, an, here's a, something to think about. What's your exposure plan if a staff member arrives with a fever? So they've already come in the office. They've probably exposed half the staff. Can you continue with the clinic that day? Do you need to sanitize everything? Do you need to cancel your patients? Um, were other staff exposed? Can you trace back who that staff member came into contact with? Keep in mind, as your staff get more comfortable in the new normal, the new normal then becomes relaxed. And then relaxed means we relax our rules and then we get lazy, so to speak. And that's when we risk exposure and we risk a resurgence. 
Do you have a plan if your staff are sick and you don't have enough staff to manage your clinic? What is that plan? Now that may not be a rehearsed plan, but your administrative team should know what that plan looks like. Do you have enough cross training in place and cross coverage so that you can still keep the doors open? Because it's vital to maintain your business in this aspect. And so you need to look at how do I make sure my doors stay open if half my staff are sick? What does that look like? Um, what if a post-op patient presents with symptoms? So I've got a two-day post-op and they're getting drain out. Or maybe they're coming in for um, a post-op from Mohs and they need their sutures removed or their wound check. What do I do? Um, what if they've been exposed and it's two days out or they have the symptoms? Do I notify the ASC? Were, were my surgical personnel exposed? What about other patients? Um, what, what is your protocol? So these are the things that you need to be thinking about and putting in place. You know, we think about universal precautions. So um, you want to practice universal source control. So wearing a mask at all times is going to be critical as we move forward. And I've had several practices that have actually made a, a clear policy that it meant termination if staff did not adhere and follow this rule. Because it's one of your highest risks is if your staff are not following the um, wearing of the mask. So here's a list of things that the CDC has put out there. As you can see, it's, it's, it's a long list, it's a healthy list, but these are um, prevention and control recommendations. So I recommend that you uh, get out there to the site, start looking at some of these things. They've got a lot of information. They help you think about your exposure, what that exposure plan should look like and how to minimize that risk. So let's take a couple of minutes and talk about consents. So consents are a little, um, it's, you tread carefully because consents have modified so much in the format of do we make it electronic? Do we keep it on paper? What am I expected to do? What am I required to do? How do I do this? Does my software support it? A lot of questions, don't have all those answers, but it is important that you have a consent. So first check with your specialty organizations they probably have consents available for you. I, I know that plastics does, I'm pretty certain DARM does, but you need to check and see if those are available for you. Um, they probably have COVID specific consents that are informed consents, so look for this information. Consider referencing COVID in all of your surgical consents. Think about this as um, a new um, informed information regarding um, the risk especially if it's a surgery patient. Consider um, a standard COVID general consent for every patient at every encounter. Again, we wanna make sure our patients understand that this is a risk. So keeping that in mind, we need to develop and implement appropriate policies. So I've talked about putting things in writing, putting things in writing, train your staff, put a policy in place. You, know, you have an employee manual. You probably need to dust it off. A lot of you probably have created an employee manual and haven't really modified it so much in the past few years. Some of you may need to pull that back out and start looking through it, but it's important to put in place that information. So some of the common questions that I hear are, can I be sued if a patient contracts COVID after coming in for an office visit? Yeah, people sue. People sue all the time for all kinds of things. I'm sure that that's gonna be one of the new things that we have to worry about, but again, Think about how you protect yourself. A consent does not mean a patient won't sue after surgery, but a consent is there to indicate that you inform the patient of the risk. So it is a means of helping protect you when and if that happens. Can my staff collect workers' compensation or disability? I'm certain at some point, if it hasn't already happened, it will happen. Again, think about the documentation. So we've talked a lot about patient documentation today, and we've talked about staff documentation. Both are just as equally important. Written policies. Don't just teach them, write the policies out. And don't just write the policies out, but ensure that you're following, you know, look at your Department of Labor um, for your state and understand what type of, um, you know, COVID things that they've got out there for your staff. But your staff need to acknowledge the training that they've been given. Your staff should be acknowledging your processes and those should be added to your employee manual or there should be um, you know, put into your exposure and risk plans. And enforce infractions. If your staff 
deviate and you don't enforce infractions, it just means that they're going to do it again and again. So while it may seem harsh, I think it's more harsh to feel that the entire staff no longer have a job because you have to close a practice because someone decided that they thought they were above the rules. So some suggested policies, you know, your PPE requirements, wearing the mask, never taking it off, et cetera. Um, cleaning between patients, that's a very good policy. Um, cleaning common areas, staff distancing, you know, do the staff get to congregate in the kitchen? Workflow for your patient encounters and um, your, ex your employee exposure plans. And then think about what is actionable. Um, again, I talked about creating the policies, adding them to your employee manual and, you know, in, enforcing things. But make sure you document. Again, this is no different than if a staff member belligerently did something within your practice that was against um, guidelines that were in your employee manual. You would still document the offense and you put that information in the employee file. But if you're concerned about um, liabilities with your staff, then be more concerned if you don't do the documentation. So you make sure that you uh, create the write-up, you know, indicate next steps. What is the action going to be if you continue this behavior? So these are things that are all important in protecting yourselves. And if you're really exceptionally proactive in this and you really follow the protocols and the documentation of it, you're just setting yourself into a better place to reduce the risk of your malpractice and your liability and the financial risk that your practice is under. So with this, I'm gonna turn over to Courtney and she is going to talk to you about all the things that can happen if you do not follow. Thank you so much, Robin. And thank you for all of that great information. So Robin shared a bunch of information about all of the things that you can do to protect your practice. Um, and I'm going to share information about what can happen if you don't take the proper steps to prepare your practice for reopening. So I'm going to talk about some legal issues that have arisen um, from COVID-19 up to this point, um, and, um, and then talk a little bit more about protecting yourself. But really, this is the scary part of the presentation. So, um, so let's dive into it. So right now things are difficult. The world is a scary place and we all want to say things that make our, our practices, or I'm sorry, our patients feel better during this difficult time, right? But be really careful about what you say to your patients in, um, in terms of COVID-19. Um, you don't want your patients to get the impression that you're offering any sort of treatment or any sort of cure, either explicit or implied. And the reason is, is because um, we're seeing a lot of focus right now on um, COVID-19 and, um, and false claims acts related to COVID-19. So false claims acts are a huge, um, a huge source of, honestly, of revenue for, for the government. In 2019, the Department of Justice actually collected $3 billion in False Claims Acts, um, False Claims Act um, recovery. Um, so you may be thinking, yeah, but this doesn't really relate to my practice. I'm not, I'm not promising COVID-19 cures or anything like that. And you might be thinking, well, I'm a dermatologist or I'm an ophthalmologist. Um, so you would think that this might be coming from other, um, other specialties, but it's interesting to note um, there's two major cases. I'm going to talk about one right now, and I'm going to talk about one in a few minutes, um, but two of the major cases where physicians have gotten in trouble for um, um, offering up um, cures for COVID-19 are both from med spa physicians. So the first one I want to talk about is a physician from San Diego who runs a med spa in San Diego. And he was recently arrested for selling what he described as a miracle cure for COVID-19. So his miracle cure for COVID-19 involved a kit that he had created that contained hydroxychloroquine, um, which incidentally he had smuggled from China, um, but he also included anti-anxiety meds, masks, 
and hand sanitizers, and he was selling this kit for $4,000. Um, now, I know that sounds way over the top, and none of you are um, out there creating these kits and selling them, but what we're seeing is with these, these physicians who have started um, uh, advertising that they can cure COVID-19, there's a lot of scrutiny. So just make sure that any claims that you are making related to COVID-19 don't look like a promise of, of a miracle cure or any type of cure or treatment. Um, because if you have anything that looks like that, it could actually prompt a closer look at your practice by the authorities. So one of the things that Robin had talked about was um, perhaps performing um, tests for clients who are going to undergo procedures. So that's something that I wanted to delve a little bit into because it's important that if you are going to offer testing for any reason in your practice, that you have the proper agreements in place with your test manufacturers. So recently, a practice was um, offering testing, and the manufacturer of those COVID-19 tests actually filed a suit against that company for falsely and deceptively advertising and offering the manufacturer's tests. So the manufacturer claimed that it never sold those tests to the defendant. Um, so you need to make sure that if you are going to offer testing, even if it's only to a subset of your patients that are um, maybe um, undergoing a procedure, that, um, that you are confirming the accuracy of your advertising and claims, um, that you have your proper agreements in place, um, and that, um, that you have agreements in place that show why you are offering testing to some um, patients and not others. So for example, if you're offering testing to your pre-surgical patients, make sure that you have a clear policy that says that this is why we're offering testing to this subset of our patients. That way you can't face any um, possible discrimination cases in the future for patients that say, well, they were offering tests, but they didn't offer a test for me. So make sure that you have all of that outlined in writing. So the other thing I wanna talk about is um, price gouging. Now, most price gouging um, litigation right now is um, it's around things like um, toilet paper and hand sanitizer and people um, you know, charging exorbitant amounts for those kind of items. Um, now, it probably doesn't apply to you related to hand sanitizer or uh, toilet paper, um, although you may be selling hand sanitizer at your front desk, um, but it is um, what we've begun to see in um, other industries, and it's beginning to creep into healthcare, is we've begun to see um, some industries that are starting to add COVID surcharges to the services that they offer. So businesses from hair salons to taxi cabs are charging more for the services they offer because in, you know, in their, in their words, they have to um, do things that they never had to do before, right? So previously, your hair salon did not have to provide personal protective equipment to their staff, um, and now they do. Um, so those businesses may be able to get away with a surcharge, but we're, like I said, we're starting to see this creep into um, healthcare a little bit. So on the screen, you'll see a COVID mitigation fee notice. So this notice actually came from a friend of mine um, who had a family member that um, went to the dentist and the dentist was charging this, um, this COVID surcharge. So this is kind of a slippery slope. Um, you know, dental offices already um, are expected to have personal protective equipment. They're already expected to sanitize between, um, between patients. Um, so those are normal aspects of, um, of running a medical type practice. Um, but when we look at any surcharges like this that may creep into actual physician practices, I think we run an even greater risk because in addition to the fact that those are normal aspects of running your practice, um, 
the payment for um, for physician office visits is highly regulated, right? So you could run afoul of um, especially government healthcare programs um, when you have a set fee for your visit already. Um, the patient has a set co-insurance or co um, or uh, copay and now all of a sudden you would um, be asking them for an additional fee um, related to items that you should normally have in place for your practice anyway so I just kind of wanted to put that out there because we are seeing more and more of this and I just wanted to um, let you guys uh, kind of think about the legal implications if you were to decide to do that in your practice um, like I said I think it's a real slippery slope so Robin talked about training your employees and making sure that they know how to protect themselves um, at work in your practice and providing them with um, personal protective equipment. Um, so she also talked a little bit about um, whether an employee can bring suit against their, um, against their employer. And um, Unfortunately, we are starting to see employees that are bringing suits um, against their employers. So I just wanted to share a couple of examples of that. Um, the first one I wanna share is um, from Walmart. And Walmart is involved in a suit right now from two of their employees that um, contracted COVID and unfortunately um, passed away. And both of these um, employees were in a Chicago area Walmart and their families are suing Walmart for wrongful death. And the reason that the families are suing Walmart for wrongful death is because they claim that the, um, that the, the, the store that these employees worked in had other employees that had COVID tested positive and that Walmart did not inform the remainder of the employees that they were at risk from having um, been in proximity to these um, employees. So it's really important that if you know that somebody has been ill in your practice, um, that you share this. And we're gonna talk a little bit that, about that in a few more minutes. Um, the other um, suit that we're seeing right now is in New York. And in New York, the New York Nurses Association actually has brought litigation against two of the New York area hospitals and also the State Department of Health for failure to provide personal protective equipment. Um, and so the reason that this is important is because, um, you know, by following these, um, these practice reopening guidelines, and by very uh, carefully documenting what you've done and what you are offering to your, um, to your staff, you may not be able to avoid these suits. Um, if something happens in your practice, you may see these suits come up anyway. However, if you are um, carefully documenting and you can show the best of intent, you can show that you provided your, pay, uh, I'm sorry, your um, employees with everything that they need, um, if litigation does occur, you're going to be able to um, to move through that litigation a lot better than if um, if you can't prove what you've done, even if you've done it. So I cannot stress enough the importance of documentation. So the last example that I wanted to share with you of a physician's office that um, that ended up um, facing litigation during uh, during the COVID-19 crisis kind of combines all the elements that we just talked about. So um, there was a case up in Michigan where um, a, a physician was not only um, offering a cure for COVID-19, um, he was bringing clients into, patients into his practice that had already tested positive for COVID-19. He had mingled those positive patients with um, patients that had not tested positive for COVID-19. And he also was mingling those, um, those patients with his staff. Um, and he was not providing adequate personal protective uh, equipment for his staff. And at least five of his employees contacted, uh, contracted the virus. So this is an extreme case, and um, this kind of combines all of the bad stuff. Um, but I think what's really important about this case is that 
the way that this came to light is um, through a whistleblower suit. So the most common way that a practice comes under scrutiny under the False Claims Act at any time, much less during COVID, is um, from employees who don't feel safe or they feel like something is not going right in the practice. And so they contact an authority and report that things aren't going like they should. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because by following the guidelines that Robin shared, by ensuring that your, your employees are protected, by ensuring that they understand what's happening, by ensuring that they feel safe and supported and that you're going to be there for them as an employer, um, they're going to feel safe. They're going to feel um, comfortable and protected, and they're going to focus on helping you run a successful and safe practice. So that's really important. So one of the things that comes up a lot during this time is um, pay, uh, employee privacy. So we talked about the importance of testing your, um, your employees on a regular basis, daily, um, to make sure that they don't have symptoms of, of COVID. But what if you have a, an employee who does show symptoms of the COVID virus? How do you handle that in your environment and still protect that employee's practice? I'm sorry, that employee's privacy. So employee privacy needs to be maintained to the extent possible. However, because this is an exceptional time, because we are in a national health emergency, it's also you have to balance that with the importance of allowing your staff to know that they may have been exposed and to take precautions for that. Um, if you're in a small practice, this might be a lot harder. So if you are a one doc practice and you have five staff and somebody um, uh, shows positive for the COVID virus, whether they show positive on a test or whether they came into the office with 103 temperature, um, it's going to be really hard to hide who that is. Um, but if you're in a larger practice, it may still be difficult to um, protect that employee's privacy, um, but you need to try to do that to the extent possible. All right, so protecting your practice. I know that Robin talked a lot about um, policies and procedures. I just want to reiterate how important it is to document your compliance with your policies and procedures. Writing down the policies and procedures is extremely important, but following that up with daily logs and documentation and sign-off sheets, um, that's really important. You need to be able, if you do face litigation, you need to be able to show that you have made a, um, uh, a concentrated and sustained effort to protect both your patients and your employees. And the way that you do that is through daily documentation. Um, when you have people coming in, your employees, and you're doing daily um, screenings, make sure that you're documenting that. And then make sure that all of the training that you give to your staff is recorded. It's so important to keep those very detailed um, training records. Um, have employees sign off on your COVID-19 related policies and procedures. That way you know that they're um, both understanding and accepting the policies and procedures that you put in place um, to protect your practice. And then make sure that your staff fully understand the expectations and can speak to the processes um, if questioned. I wanna also just make sure that when you're developing your policies and pr procedures, that you are supporting those with current guidance from trusted sources. So utilizing the CDC, the Department of Labor, American Medical Association, and go ahead and cite those sources in your documentation so that um, if you are ever called upon to share why you did something, that you can point to a trusted source um, to show why you shared that. And then also, make sure that you are checking on your malpractice coverage. So um, this is gonna vary by, um, by insurer. It's also gonna vary by state. And um, you wanna check with your malpractice insurer and ensure that, um, that your limits are appropriate during the COVID-19 crisis. 
So um, surgeons especially may be required to increase your limits um, if you are providing um, if you're providing surgical services during the COVID-19 crisis. And also, if you're providing telemedicine, you need to double check to see if your um, telemed or, I'm sorry, if your malpractice insurer requires an additional rider or additional coverage um, for um, providing uh, telemedicine services. And then I can't stress enough how important it is to stay informed. Um, things are changing so quickly. I, I know Robin and I both are looking daily at the information that's coming out from the CDC, from OSHA, from all these different sources. Um, put yourself on these listservs, make sure that you're checking the, um, the sites, and make sure that you stay on top of any changes that are required um, to protect yourself, your patients, and your employees um, during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and then in addition to staying informed about those changes, make sure that you are changing your policies and updating your staff as necessary as things change. Um, if, you know, if new guidance comes out, and I know it's a lot, but if new guidance comes out that requires a change in your policy, you wanna make sure that you update your policy um, as appropriate and that you document the change that you made to your policy and the date that it occurred on and that you shared that information with your staff. Um, make sure that you watch for expiration dates that are related to your licensing, um, uh, to telemedicine and any other COVID exceptions. I know we've talked a lot about telemedicine. I think it's going to continue after the COVID crisis has ended, but we don't know um, we don't know what changes are going to be made in the current waiver. So it's important to keep an eye on that. And as usual, um, Next Tech will keep an eye on that and uh, help keep you guys informed as well. Um, and then make sure that you're staying on top of um, any executive orders in your state. Um, you can see here that the American College of Surgeons has a list, a list of state executive orders. This is extremely helpful information, and it can help you stay on top of any changes that might affect you or your practice. So that is the end of our presentation. Um, we'd like to thank you all for attending. And at this time, we would like to go ahead and take questions and answer as many questions as we can between now and the top of the hour. Um, so I'm going to open our question box and Courtney, most of them I was able to answer while you were speaking. Awesome. Are there any that are outstanding right now that you think we need to look at? Mm. One of the most common questions that we receive um, during all of our presentations is, is the presentation going to be made available? And um, absolutely, um, if you are registered for the presentation, you will receive a link to the recorded presentation um, within the next couple of days. Um, let's see. Robin, since you are answering questions, um, if you wanna throw some questions out there that maybe weren't answered, I'm looking at some that have come in recently as well. There was a question about physical distancing because the CDC and OSHA both recommend it and uh, maybe there's a limitation on the workplace. And so the question was asked, um, what is the risk if the employer chooses not to implement physical distancing where the employees sit at desks that are closer than six feet during the workday and also choose to not re um, engineer the break room so employees may use the break room while physically distancing during their 15 minute breaks. Um, my response would be that you're exposing your staff and that just opens up a whole set of um, other circumstances that can be as, you know, some of the examples that Courtney brought to light with other staff and, you know, the whistleblower type of event or even in another consideration that everybody gets sick and then you don't have anybody there to actually run the business, um, that can be a financial risk as well. I don't know, Courtney, if you have anything to add. Yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. Um, and, you know, those re, um, 
make sure that your 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 staff understand that you know what you're putting in place for them is for their protection as well as the patients. I mean, we're all healthcare providers and we're all here to protect our patients. So um, I got a question on here about how to handle staff that refuse to keep their mask on. And I would, um, you know, I would refer back to Robin's earlier comments, you know, um, you need to have a policy that states that all staff will wear their mask um, throughout the workday. Um, and that it is a requirement to provide patient care or to interact with other employees. Um, and if your staff refuses to keep the mask on, then they would be subject to sanctions um, and not be allowed to, um, to participate in, um, in your clinics uh, or your practices workday activities. Um, it just puts others at risk. Uh, there's a question out here about will you, meaning Next Tech, have a COVID consent available on the Next Tech patient app. Courtney, you want to take that? So Next Tech doesn't write consents. Um, we we would refer you back to your um, your professional society um, to look for what consents might be um, appropriate for your practice. Um, and because we do have a large variety of specialties that we serve, um, we're we don't we're not prescriptive about consents. Um, however, um, we are, um, we're working toward the ability to provide consents. Um, the consent that we offer right now um, in telehealth is a telehealth specific consent. Um, but um, we are looking at um, how we can incorporate consents for other things. Um. There's a question here. Do you have any input on the practice of screening but not logging temps? Only logging temps if not within normal range for staff. I would say my answer is, is there's never um, too much documentation. And if you show due diligence that you have not only screened them, but you daily logged that, then that again shows your staff that you're working very hard to protect them as well as the environment, but the business as well. People, these days people are worried about getting a paycheck. They're worried about keeping their job, but keeping their job is not just the financial piece. It's the risk of everyone getting sick within the practice. I absolutely agree. I would log every temperature that you take, whether it's normal or not. Um, again, it just shows that you are protecting your practice. And that's what this is all about, right? It's about protecting your patients and it's about protecting your employees, but it's also about protecting your practice as a whole um, and protecting against anybody who might come and say, well, I don't feel like my practice um, as an employee or a patient. Um, you don't want anybody to come back and say, you know, I don't feel like they did enough to protect me. So I would log everything that you're doing. Here's an interesting question. It references um, how do physicians working in high-rise medical buildings with elevators best comply with, um, uh, you know, reducing that risk with social distancing? You know, there's a few ways to think about it. Um, you could wait and not get on the elevator that appears to be overly crowded or have, you know, more than one or two people in it. Another option is um, last week we talked about in our webinar and you know having your um, staff change their attire when they get to the office so that they're not wearing outside clothes you know, reducing that exposure from that perspective your staff could be wearing masks while they're out um, so when they get out of their car put their mask on and wear it and all the way up you know into the office as they should be wearing it all day as well courtney do you have anything that you want to add to that no i would agree with those measures um you know, it, it is difficult. Um, I think, you know, I think the, the points you made are, are great points. Um, you know, I live in a very rural area, so I haven't had to face getting on an elevator with other people for any reason. Um, but I think that um, that raises great concerns. And I would also maybe consider, you know, when I'm talking to my patients, um, suggesting that they um, maintain social distancing by waiting as well. Um, there's a question in here about um, about a COVID screening and if we have a COVID screening 
um, in Next Tech. So we do have a COVID screening in our um, Touchless Practice app um, for um, for client uh, patients to fill out. We don't have a COVID screening form for employees in the software. Um, so that would be something that would be outside of the software and would be kept more in a um, uh, in a practice um, in a practice file somewhere, not in the electronic health record. I think, Courtney, we've uh, hit the top of the hour. So if there's any additional questions that we perhaps um, feel that we need to address, we'll answer those and those will be included with the presentation that will be sent out. Um, marketing department finalizes this and they generally send it later today or tomorrow, but it's usually within uh, one to two days at the very most and then you'll have that presentation. That includes these slides as well as some additional links that we referenced in here that you'll have access to to um, hopefully encourage some of these things that we've talked about today. So thank you for your time and we look forward to um, supporting you as a company and um, being there to keep you educated and keep you informed. Have a great afternoon. Thank you everybody.